I will begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for the students. Just pray you bless this class, Lord. Help us to uh, glorify you what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I wanted to uh, talk to you guys a little bit about something called uh, representation theory. Representation theory. And I'll start out with some basic, just a basic example. Um, definition, if G is a group, then a vector space V um, <clears throat> forms a representation if <clears throat> there exists a um, homomorphic um, subgroup of <clears throat> GLV which acts on V. So the idea here is that you've got, you've got G, you've got some homomorphism psi, let's say, then psi of G is a, is a subset of um, GLV, GLV being, um, let's say, L mappings from V to V, such that um, L invertible, and of course linear. So this is what's called a, a representation um, of a group. It's a, it's a set of um, linear transformations, invertible linear transformations on some vector space, which has the same sort of shape as the group, if you will. Um, if this homomorphism is, in fact, um, if, this, if, if psi is injective, then it's said to be a faithful representation. Let me just show you an example of this explicit calculational, if you will. Um, so there's kind of a natural way of doing this, which is to use the group algebra idea I shared with you guys previously. So let's look at the group algebra um, of Let's see here, how about uh, 1, j, and j squared, where um, j cubed is equal to, to 1. So this is just kind of a, a funny notation for the uh, cyclic group of order 3, right? This is, we some call it, sometimes we call this c sub 3. Our typical notation was a, 1, a, a squared. I'm using j because it's a superior letter. And um, anyway, so, uh, sorry, I'm an idiot. But um, we can form the group algebra. I forget my notation. I think maybe R sub G. Uh, anyway, wh whatever you want to denote that thing. And that's going to be things of the form X plus YJ plus ZJ squared, such that X, Y, and Z are in um, the reals. All right. Um, now that's a... Uh, that's the so-called group algebra. It is a ring, right, um, which somehow is naturally attached to G in a way, right? I mean, this ring has sort of formal linear combinations, formal real linear combinations of the group element. So this is the group algebra is not a group, right? But it is a, an algebra um, in the natural sense of being a ring while being a vector space which is also closed under multiplication. Here, the way you multiply things is just by the usual a plus bj plus cj squared. If I multiply that by x plus yj plus zj squared, what do I get? I think I worked this out for you guys another day, but just coming back to it again here just to make a few more comments. This would be um, ax plus... Um, bz 
plus cy. Ooh, let me write that. Let me write that in, well, fine. I'm going to write that plus cy. I'm going to write that y first, plus cy um, plus bz. I'm going to try to write xyz every time, OK? Um, plus j. How do I get? How do I get a J? I get a J from BX. I get a J from um, A times Y. I get a J from J squared times J squared, which is CZ. And let's see here, J squared multiplying. What do I got? I got um, CX. How else can I get J squared? Um, BY. And then finally, AZ. So there's your, your ring multiplication, if you will. You can prove that that's associative, that it's got the right distributiv distributivity properties. It's commutative, because the underlying group is commutative. Um, OK, great. Then, um, so we can form a representation um, of G on R3 in a sort of natural way, right? We can look at it as left multiplication by 1, left multiplication by j, or left multiplication by j squared. My claim is that this is, um, in fact, a faithful representation of g on R3. So my mapping is just psi of, you know, psi of, um, psi of G is equal to LG. Now, there's, a, of course, a natural correspondence. I mean, you can either think of this as, um, you know, we can either think of this as linear transformations, or we can think of it as matrices. I think I'd... Um, so I'm, I think I've just used my matrix notation, which is bad. Um, well, I guess I haven't. Let's say that this is naturally isomorphic to G, L. How did I do it? Three com I forget my notation. Was it 3 comma R? Something like that. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is um, linear transformations over here, say matrices, OK? Anyway. Now, um, let's see here. So my question is, what's the matrix then of, um, what is this, if I look at this instead of as linear transformations, <coughs> as the corresponding matrices, maybe that's a little bit more explicit for us. What's the, um, I think it's nice for you guys to see matrices. Um, so L, L sub 1 would correspond to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? How about L multiplication by J? What's that look like? What's the matrix of left multiplication by J look like? We know this. This is math 321, right? I mean, this is, so we should do like LJ of 1, LJ of, of J, and LJ of J squared. Because in this context, the basis for R3 is what? In this construction, the basis is formed by 1, j, and j squared. Those are respectively playing the roles of E1, E2, and E3 in our usual linear algebra notation. I mean, that's by construction here. So the first is what? This is j. This is j squared. And this is j cubed, right? So what is that in the other, in the e1, e2, e3 notation? This 
under our current identifications is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then this is, of course, equal to 1. So 1, 0, 0. Just to be clear, I'm saying that this we're identifying as E1, this we're identifying as E2, this we're identifying as E3. E1 is 1, E2 is J, E3 is J squared. So under that identification, there's the matrix of left multiplication by J. And then, of course, we have over here the left multiplication by J squared matrix, which would be what? Wait, are you reading rows or columns to me? Zero what? Zero, one, zero. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Let's see if I believe you. Oh, dear. I mean, it should be the case that this matrix is the square of that matrix, right? Because this is basically playing the role of J in the matrix world, and this is playing the role of J squared in the matrix world. Not that those are J or J squared. In my current language, J and J squared are vectors. Right, fair enough. That's actually, that, that's a good comment, Sam. So this would be psi of j. This would be psi of, but even that's a lie because I define my in psi in, oh, psi in, in brackets. Ah, precision for the win. Let's see here. Yes. It's a standard matrix of the linear transformation. Left multiplication by j. Yes, very good. Perfect. Perfect. That is actually true. It's not an identification. That's actually literally what those are. Very good. So is that actually, if I square the middle matrix, do I get the third one? I have to think about it in my brain. I get the first column. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. We have just discovered how to create a set of three by three matrices, which are isomorphic to the cyclic group of order three. You can play this game with any group. You can take a, a group, of, group of order five. You can form the group algebra of it, right? You can look at left multiplication on R5 by the group, right? And you can look at the matrices of that, and that will give you corresponding matrices which satisfy the same algebra as your original group. This gives us a way of constructing any finite group as a subset of matrices, right? Now we had this. What was it? What was that theorem about? Any group can be looked at as a subset of the permutation group? Oh, Cayley's theorem. theorem, right. So this is the matrix analog of that. And of course, these are not surprisingly called permutation matrices, right? Because these were, how are we getting these? We're getting these from taking the identity matrix and doing what? Permuting, right? These are, in fact, permutation matrices. So. But I don't know. I think it's a neat calculation. I, if you look at last year's final, you'll notice this was the final question there. Or something like it. A lot of you guys got it last year. Like, so you're not asking it this year then. I was like, well, this, is the, this is always the debate, right? I mean, <laughs> but rather than debating what's on the test, just try to understand. Let's see here. How about that? OK, so there is more. <clears throat> last, um, so last time I taught this course, I said these, some of these things at the start of the course because I think they're motivational. Um, but this semester, I tried to follow um, Nicholson, and it didn't really fit the, uh, didn't fit the, uh, what's the word, um, narrative for the start. So I didn't, I didn't talk about physics at all, but I'd like to take 10 minutes just to talk to you guys about group representations in physics. Then I'll give you your test back, and we'll talk about solution. Um, if I can find. Well, if this thing will turn on. Oh, where is that? So the first place I studied group representation theory was um, in a physics department um, with a somewhat reputable physicist and uh, 
I mean, a reputable physicist, I shouldn't say somewhat reputable. There, there's really no <laughs> pox on his record or anything. I mean, he's done more than I'll ever do, for sure. But um, he, from a mathematical perspective, it was just, to me, it was just this, this um, sort of amalgam of bizarre, unmotivated calculations. And um, so I, 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 I'll subject you to the same. Um, Let's see here. So quantum mechanics. Uh, I'm just kidding. There are actually very good books on this now. These notes are roughly based on uh, a self-study I did of Greiner, Greiner's Quantum Mechanics, which is a great series of books. But uh, in short, quantum mechanics is the study of the wave function. This is um, Schrodinger's equation, but written in the, uh, the Hamiltonian formalism. And you can see what this says. This says that if this operator H acts on the wave function psi, we get back partial psi partial t. So if you were to if you were to rewrite this, um, you can see that your well. Let's see here. If you could, if you can find an eigenfunction of the uh, Hamiltonian operator, then maybe you can solve this somehow. Let me get, get to it here. Um, I don't have time to teach quantum mechanics today, but this is the basic theory: is that um, you can look at symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Those are actually unitary transformations. And um, in other words, they satisfy u dagger u equal to 1. And um, you can build them from what's called the Lie algebra. This minus i factor is because of physics. They want, their, they want the Lie algebra to be Hermitian. To make the Lie algebra Hermitian operators forces the eigenvalues to be real, which is good because eigenvalues are physical observables. So physical observables ought to be real. But in short, a symmetry of the Hamiltonian is a operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian. This is the Lie bracket. So this is like HU minus UH. Right? And so if you can find things that simultaneously um, diagonal, uh, if they commute with the Hamiltonian, their commutator is zero. And the linear algebra of that means that you can find a simultaneous set of eigenstates for both. Um, so what that means is, in terms of quantum mechanics, if you have an operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian, you can measure the value of that operator simultaneously with energy, both with um, arbitrary precision. In contrast, if the operator you're looking at doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, that means you can't find a simultaneous set of eigenstates, and then the uncertainty principle comes into play. But the larger story here is um, the symmetry group of the Hamiltonian, um, the, the physical wave function ends up having to be a representation of the physical symmetry group. And that probably more properly means that it's a representation of the Lie algebra, uh, the physical symmetry group. And so there's a lot of beautiful mathematics that comes from that, which ultimately leads to things like you've, if you've had a course in chemistry here. How many people have actually had a course in chemistry here? I was having debating with my wife. Who has not had a course in chemistry here? Who has never had a course in chemistry? So you guys had chemistry in high school, most of you? OK, fair enough. But you may, you may it's, so it may be a somewhat fuzzy memory, but in chemistry we had all these like weirdo selection rules, remember? Like you can go from one level to the next and there's all this sort of, it's almost like a board game or something. All of those selection rules can be derived from rep group representation theory. Um, and so I'm showing you the, sort of the tip of that iceberg. But something a little bit more interesting. What is a symmetry? A symmetry is something in physics where you have two things that appear to be the same, right? But maybe they're not quite the same, but there's something sort of similar about them, you know? So proton and neutron is a good example of this. They have nearly the same mass. And if you study a free neutron, it's a lifetime of like 11 minutes, it'll, it'll decay into a proton and then something called an electron. You've heard of those and um, other things you haven't heard of. But you can put protons and neutrons in what's called a, a doublet. And you can think about one of them rotating into the other and you can think about them having something called isospin. And if you've got a lot of time on your hands and a way to smash particles into each other, you'll find out that other things have isospin. And um, there are these things called pions. And you can talk about pions plus or minus or neutral pions colliding with protons to give protons again or colliding with neutrons to output neutrons and protons. Or they combine pi zero collides with protons and out comes protons and neutrons and pi pluses. And in each one of these cases, you can see that there's a, con there's a conservation of what's called the isospin. The uh, proton having isospin 1, the pi plus have isospin 1 half, 
And so if you, you can make up this thing called isospin and see that it's conserved. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question, how on earth do people come up with isospin, right? Well, there's this thing called spin, which we were aware of before. That's harder to miss. There's this um, thing called the stern gerlach experiment in the 30s that they passed electrons through a magnetic field. Some of them went one way. Some of them went the other way. That's unexplained except for the presence of spin. So the ones that spin up go one way, the ones that spin down go the other way. So we knew about the existence of spin. Isospin is something more uh, abstract. But we can see its, its apparent existence because of these, 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 these interactions which are observed and other ones which were not. Right? Now, so all of that puts together, you can put that all together by saying that the pi plus minus and the pi naught form a, um, this, this sort of representation of the isospin symmetry. And um, these are the, the quantum numbers of them. They each have isospin 1. This has a component 1, component 0, or component minus 1. So it's like the, the total amount. And this is sort of the part in the z direction in some sense. I'm being too specific. Let me go on here. So if you examine this isodoublet, neutron and proton, and the isotriplet, the pions, you can notice that there's a certain regularity in the electric charge of the states you can describe the pattern by saying that there's something called hypercharge, and the charge is equal to one half the hypercharge plus the third component of the isospin. This is apparently the Gelman Nishimi relation. <laughs> um, all right, anyway. So so what? And you can you can you can check that this definite this this invention of hypercharge in fact verifies all of these relations that I've already claimed, like the charge of the neutron, the charge of the proton, the charge of the pion, the charge of the pi, the charge of the pi minus. And this is the charge that you've just been tested on. Okay. It's not an abstract. This is like electric charge I'm talking about with the Q. Um, charge of the, the, the iso, the, the hypercharge is something else, something more. All right, so what? Well, that wasn't all they found. The particle zoo is this is sort of a, a re recap of what happened in the early 20th century. We found all kinds of particles as they built these, these particle accelerators and studied the you know collisions of protons and neutrons and other things. And they soon had this dizzying array of different particles. We had these kaons, the eta, the pi the pions I talked about already, the um, other kaons, these things I don't know the name of, uh, sigma particles I think. Um, See, I'm pretty much limited. If, if it happens to be named after a Greek letter, I've got a chance of knowing its name. But um, like this is, I think, a lambda particle. And um, <laughs> N is for neutron, P is for proton, that, that I got. But um, anyway, so if you arrange the properties that these particles were observed to have in the isospin slash hypercharge plane, you get, start getting these really beautiful regular symmetries, I mean, regular patterns, right? And so in physics, to start with, this is rather mysterious. Why should there be these patterns? Where is it going? What's next? There's also this baryon decouplet. So here you have the, these um, delta particles, the sigma particles, the excited states of sigma particles, probably the stars. And um, all of the things in red were discovered, all right? And you have to understand, they had this, this mess of data. They had to have the, the, the insight to arrange the data in terms of hypercharge versus isospin. Like that's the genius of even thinking to try that. Because these, these, these patterns would have remained unseen if they hadn't thought to do that, right? But doing that, and you make a nice picture, it's like, ooh, there's something missing here. This guy, right? And in fact, this is something that they won, I think, the Nobel Prize for, because they predicted the existence of this omega minus particle two years before we found it in like 64. And, um, I think Dr. Scambordis has actually had, he's either had a class or he's sat in talks by this guy. It's pretty neat. So then, but still, you gotta understand, why are these patterns? Where are these patterns coming from? This is not explained. It's just like, well, this is, this, if, if, it, um, if it's a representation of SU3, um, in this case, then you can have these patterns. All right and it fits the data that they found. But where, where, where are those patterns coming from? And that's where the substructure of SU3 comes into play. In other words, you can build 
SU3 from taking tensor, tensor products of fundamental representations. I'll get to it. I'm not going to go to the details here, but you can basically look at three copies of SU2 representations inside the SU3. They satisfy these, these beautifully algebraic re, re, uh, relations. Blah, 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 blah. And so you have these fundamental U, V, and T operators. You can build um, states from these, these, these uh, you get these motions allowed in the isospin hypercharge plane from these fundamental SU2 subalgebras of SU3. Getting to it eventually here. So, <clears throat> come on. Oh, I do have page down, don't I? So SU3 multiple mu SU3 multiplets those patterns I was I was showing you like with, like with the delta or the or the hexa hexagonal things um, those can be formed from tensoring together the fundamental representations of three and three bar so this is the three this is the three bar and the idea is that there's something called a quark and that quark bears a three representation the anti quark bears a three bar representation. By saying a quark has a three and a quark, anti quark has a three bar, when you tensor them together, you're allowed to, you're, you're able to create all of those different possibilities of hypercharge and 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 and, um, <clears throat> and charge and isospin that you want. And there's also this baryon number and strangeness that comes into play, but that's part of the deeper board game that I'm not entirely explaining. Um, but anyway, here's a picture that you can understand. If you take the tensor product of this and that, what you do is you just attach a copy of this graph at each one of these nodes, and that gets you this, which gets you that, which is what we, which, which we found experimentally before all of this was suggested. The building these things from quarks was suggested after we found the patterns. Okay. And you can also take three quarks and put them together like this. And that's how you build the other pattern. In particular, that's how you can build a proton as a up, up, down quark, or a neutron as a up, down, down quark. It gives it the requisite hypercharge, strangeness, and, and, and the rest of it. Sure. Yeah, you take the, because the, uh, the hadrons, hadronic matter is made of three quarks. Each one of the quarks has fractional charge. Got like a, not a whole charge, but like a third of a charge of electron. You put them together, you can have a net charge of one one charge. Or the neutron, you can have plus a third, plus a third. I, I think the quarks can also have charge. I'm saying this wrong. I think the quarks can also have charge what? It's minus two thirds, right? I'm trying to forget here. No, I'm not trying to forget. I'm trying to remember. Um, I, it's not something I'm actually. Sometimes I want to forget physics, but it's not this part. <laughs> it's definitely not this part. Anyway, the basic point is each quark is assigned a color, red, green, or blue. Um, that, that's SU3 color, and it's used to explain how the colored quarks interact. SU3 color is, in fact, a local gauge symmetry, which has a rich, rich and complex structure, is as fully exposed in this thing called quantum chronodynamics, which is something I don't think we understand the full theory of. So what I've shown you is more or less why people believe there are quarks inside matter. It's because it's very striking. If you say that there's something called a quark that, has this, that bears this SU3 symmetry, by tensoring together these basic SU3 representations, we can build that particle zoo, right? And we can explain why protons and neutrons interact as they do. And you can do a lot more that I haven't shown you, right? Yet, we cannot observe quarks in isolation, right? You can't observe a quark just out on its lonesome because as far as we know, we can only observe charge and integer multiples of the electron charge. So this is a you know this is a very interesting thing we found. We've 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 been a great success in explaining all kinds of physics, but it is almost necessarily unobservable. Right. But um, anyway, I think your college students you should hear these things at some point, right? But my larger point to you is that this is all mathematics. And it's what it is, is it's abstract group theory, right? It's all group theory. Now, that said, I'm saying I'm using group theory in the sense of a physicist, which is not actually as a group. It's possibly a Lie algebra. I'm talking about Lie algebras. I'm talking about vector spaces. I'm talking about lots of stuff. 
yeah, there's groups in there, SU3, SU2, but there's so much more. Anyway, there are a number of systematic lies I'm making here, but I'll um, leave it at that. So let's talk about test three. <clears throat> so as it is most of the time, the rich are very rich and the poor are very poor. And it seems the poor will always be with us. Somebody should have said that. Let's see here once upon a time. No, but there is hope for everyone. Um, so the first problem I think a lot of you got, more or less. Um, So let me try to hand back these while oh, I'm at this here. Hand that back to Sabrina. Hand it back to Chris. Koi. Peter. Mackenzie. Uh, other Peter. All the way in the back. Steven's not here. Sam. Emily, right behind you. Alan. So any questions about problem one while I'm doing this procedural stuff? Christy. Back to Christy right there. Andrew. Finch. No. Joshi. So any questions about problem one? Here's a question. If I'd gone over this applications of group theory to physics earlier on, would that have motivated you to study harder for this course? <laughs> I think probably not. <laughs> but but I, I think it's in physics. Physics is demotivating. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the more interesting thing is what we'll do next semester, which is see how you can use group theory to study, study symmetries of roots of equations. In fact, the fact that uh, an equation has a, you can rotate roots one into the other, this forms what's called the Galois group, and we'll be able to prove or disprove the existence of higher quadratic formulas like quintic formulas and so forth. So, But I have relegated that to Math 422. Trust me, it is in everyone's best interest that I did that. There exists a crazy course where you tried to cover it in the last two weeks, but I'm not that crazy yet. OK, so um, let R be an integral domain. All right, so let me rant a little bit. Some of you are treating R as if it is a element. This is very, very wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you cannot do this it's no bueno no this is not, not no I don't know how to say this more forcefully no you have to think about elements here um, <clears throat> so it's not so the, the, the most of the point here is we have a ring it's an integral domain so one is in there um, so if one is in there, that means that A is an RA, but that means that A is also an RB, which means what? That means there exists an R2 in B. Uh, a, there exists an R2 such that A is equal to R2B. You can reverse the argument. You also get that B is equal to R3A. Put these two things together. We get that A is equal to R2, R3A, but we're in an integral domain. We have cancellation. Consequently, R2, R3 is 1, which means that R2 is the unit, and consequently, A and B are associates. Now. Most of you have glommed on to Nicholson's definition of associate, which is that they're associates if A divides B and B divides A. All right? That's fine. That's your prerogative. But that's not how I think about it. Okay? I realize those are equivalent, but just so you know, I didn't take off points if you actually have proved 
that A divides B and B divides A. That's the other way, of course, to show that they're associates, right? Now, if you didn't know that A squiggle B means they're associates, well, you should ask me about that. That I would answer, for sure. Now, problem three was homework, right? And um, so the, the, the basic thing here is we have to pick a point in the nil radical of the quotient. That means we got a coset, right, which to some power is zero, which means that to some power it is n of r. But that then implies that x to the m is in n r, which means that this element is nilpotent, which means that there exists some other number k such that, you know, that m to m to the k is zero, which then by laws of exponents means that x to the mk is zero, which is to say that x is nilpotent. But hey, if x is nilpotent, that means that x plus nr is just nr again, which means that anything in here is just, is just zero. So it's not hard for me to see if your argument's wrong. If you don't use two integers, you're probably wrong. Right. Problem four, we had harder things in the homework than this, right? Like I asked you guys, we had suffered through the problem to show that u plus a nilpotent, a unit plus a nilpotent is invertible, right? This is the easiest case of that problem. Um, so some of you got it, some of you not so much. Um, I forget exactly what you did wrong here, but there were there was wrongness, but let's go on. It's not that interesting. Um, again, kind of geometric theories, right? So it's neat. And um, many of you almost, so like a lot of you like this argument. Instead of finding directly what I asked, you first, you, you put pluses here, right? And you put one minus eta over here, and you show that that was a unit. And then you're like, lemma, and then apply it to the minus, one minus eta, uh, one plus eta being a unit. That's, I, I, that's a neat argument. I mean, I, I thought that was good. I mean, is that a Nicholson or something? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, this, these, this was not meant to be an unfriendly question, but apparently it was because there was much suffering here, much suffering. Um, so this is Eisenstein with 5 um, because 5 divides 10, 15, and 20, but 25 does not divide 20. And um, 1 is, of course, it's monic, so of course 5 doesn't divide 1. And um, so it's irreducible by Eisenstein's criteria. This one. Um, if, we if we reduce over Z2, um, there's hope, but that's not enough because this is quartic. So no zeros does not imply irreducibility for a quartic, right? As I have emphasized, cubic or quadratic only. If it's quartic, then you gotta do, you got to do more work. you got to show that this thing, x squared plus x plus 1, is not a factor. That's your only choice because the only way we can, fa well, first of all, the fact that both of these are non-zero does tell me something. It tells me that there's no linear factor over Z2, right? So I, that by, by, by looking at the degree, I know I have to look at quadratic. But because it's Z2, there's only one quadratic to look for, right? All of the other quadratics over Z2 are, are reducible, right? X squared is reducible. X squared plus X is reducible. X squared plus 1 is reducible. All three of those are reducible, and that's all there is. And if you do long division here, you get one, which shows you that the remainder is one. So by the factor theorem, this does not divide that. Or you could, as one of you did, and I thought this was a better argument than mine, you're like, well, if it, if it factors, it's a, it's a quartic, it's monic, what else could it be? Um, <laughs> I'm foreseeing your comment. And, um, so if it's quartic and it's what it is, then it has to, the only possibility is that it's that one irreducible quadratic times itself. That's, that, I mean, by logic, yeah, you're right. So if you multiply the, you know, x squared plus x plus 1 by itself and you don't get back the quartic, that also would prove that it's irreducible. So there is a way, along the, right, way around the long division if you're thinking clearly. And I was, I was very impressed with that argument. That's good. Um, so this is, of course, fixing the homework problem that I inadvertently copied down wrong. 
Um, and there is an error in the current key because, um, oh, it's all Zach's fault. But see, this, this is fun. I should always let students write solutions. Then I could always blame everything wrong on them. Yeah, why don't I always do that? I should do that. Anyway, um, no, but okay. So the the larger idea here with ideals, the notion. So A divides B, right? So if you look at the corresponding ideals, what does it mean for A to divide B? If we look at the ideal corresponding to A, the ideal corresponding to B. Well, it means that, that <clears throat> A divides B ends up meaning that the ideal corresponding to A contains the ideal corresponding to B, right? So if you, if you were to let one, if you, were let, if you were to let everything be a prime ideal, right, then that would contain everything. And so that would be a prime, quote unquote, prime ideal factor of everything. So that would be sort of the set analog of letting one be a prime. That's why we can't let the whole thing be a prime. There's an explanation for you, but, or you could find the definition. We said that it couldn't be everything, but, <clears throat> or we should have said it and we didn't, and then shame on me, or shame on Nicholson, more likely me. But let's blame Zach for the moment. Um, so yes, we do need to check that one goes to one, the additive, the multiplicative, and then the thing you guys are probably wondering about, all that's pretty straightforward. Finding the kernel, pretty straightforward. Um, some of you have stated it's a prime ideal, but didn't give me any reason for why. Well, the reason is that if we look at R mod the kernel, we have it's isomorphic to Z by the first isomorphism theorem, but this is an integral domain, consequently that's prime, right? The reason it's not maximal is because this is not a field, right? So it's not maximal. Now, <clears throat> to make something to, to, to find a maximal ideal, I basically need to find a new map that its kernel actually mods to a field. And the way to do that, and this is the thing I couldn't think of in the help session, because, well, there are many reasons, but <clears throat> is you, you, all you do is you just compose with the, the, the coset map to uh, mod 2. And what that does is then the kernel ends up being um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The kernel ends. Well, first of all, it maps to. It's a surjection onto Z2, which is a field, and then we have R mod J, where J is the kernel um, of the um, the original map composed with the the coset map. Um, that mod that that kernel is isomorphic to Z2, which is a field. Consequently, J must be maximal. And you could just as well do this with three, seven, thirteen, eleven. Pick your prime. The, the larger idea here, guys, is that if you want to find a maximal ideal, find a way to use the isomorphism theorem and to create a field in the image. Right? That's the non-intuitive, but should be intuitive to us as students of abstract algebra step that I couldn't think of in the help session. We were trying to do it directly. And I think only one person was really successful in the direct approach. Or did you, I don't know. I don't know. You did a mixture. I, I couldn't tell because it looked like you were kind of doing the mapping, but kind of not. Um, seven we did in class. This is half. We did the if and only if proof in class. I just made it implication to make it easier for you guys. This is a new problem, but I hoped it wasn't going to be impossible. The basic idea is just to either divide by D or by F. It leaves you the remaining factor, but details, it's really 0 cross D or F or, or D cross 0 or 0 cross F that you have to modify though, because otherwise it's not technically in D in R, so we can't, I mean we have to use 0 cross the thing in order to actually form the division, otherwise we're modding by something that's not in the set, which is bad. Um, a lot of you got the 0 divisors, yay, that was, I was happy about that. Um, and so you, you can look at this, it's actually not that hard if you had the right idea, but not all you did. And, um, here, finally, problem nine. I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people thought too hard about this. Um, we had some examples, like ex problem twenty-one, and there's a few other homework problems. Um, this kind of set is a subset of the complex numbers, so you can form reciprocals using complex arithmetic. 
So there's proof. Um, now, <clears throat> part B, the picky point here would be showing that x squared plus 2 is irreducible. Um, I guess you could use, you could use Eisenstein. <laughs> that seems a little heavy-handed, but I suppose you could use Eisenstein with uh, t equals to 2 to show it's irreducible, right? Does 2 squared divide 2? No. And does 2 divide the leading coefficient? No. There's no middle coefficients to check, so yeah. But I, I, I resisted the urge. I showed you why it doesn't have a 0, because there's no solution to c squared equals to minus 2 in q. So it's irreducible. Consequently, this is a field. And then the natural isomorphism is just to swap out your square root of minus 2 for x bar. And you can prove that that's an that's a isomorphism. Um, z of x. Uh, for, for part b, you can factor x squared plus 1 is x plus 1 squared. So that's kind of a deal breaker for it being prime because neither x, x plus 1 is not in there. So that means that we have a product of two things which is in the ideal, but neither of the things forming the product is in the ideal. That violates the definition of prime. Um, there are other ways you could prove it. For example, if you look at the quotient, you don't get a field consequently. I assume you don't get an integral domain because there's zero divisors. These are the zero divide. Anyway, I shut up. Um, prime subfield, we didn't talk about this a long time, but it is in fact true that ZP is the prime subfield if it has characteristic P, and Q, not Z. A lot of you wrote Z here. Z is not a field. Not a field. Z is not a field. Q. SQ. Um, the ascending chain condition was that each chain of ideals in a ring terminates at finite end. If that's true, this ring satisfies the ascending chain condition. And we use that to prove that principal ideal implies uh, unique factorization domain. Quaternions were what I was looking for here. Um, there are probably other examples, but I don't think the example you guys gave me was the other example. Um, if, example if possible, give an example of a prime which is not irreducible. No can do. Um, we, have a, we have a theorem which says that prime implies um, irreducible in integral domain. By the way, we've only defined prime and irreducible in integral domains, so that, that, that's everything. Um, there are a couple different examples here, but there's one for a, a prime, a irreducible, which is not prime. And then finally, how to construct complex numbers. You take the real polynomials and mod by x squared plus 1. So, sorry I went over, but I started three minutes late. So I feel like, to be fair, I went six minutes over. No? Anyway, I don't think there'll be a help session tomorrow. We're done. So, you got questions? You can come talk to me.